Well, welcome to your um, book launch event. Um, my name is Pat Smith, and I will be cheering this evening. This evening, um, I'm active in the Radical Independence Campaign and in Rise, Scotland's Left Alliance, and other campaigns that I won't bore you with at the moment. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'm sure you're all very excited uh, to hear what Neil has to say about his new book. Uh, I'll just say a little bit about Neil. I'm sure you're all very familiar with him, but in case you aren't, um, he's, before he began his academic career in 2008, Neil worked as a civil servant or uh, what Marxists sometimes refer to as a state manager. <laughs> <laughs> he worked with the Scottish government and its predecessors for more than 20 years, so he feels that he's reasonably well qualified to discuss how the state actually works, and in fact how it doesn't work. He's the author of uh, six books, The Origins of Scottish Nationhood, the Deutsche Prize win winning, uh, Discovering the Scottish Revolution, How Revolutionary Were the Bourgeois Revolutions, and three volumes of his collected essays, uh, of which his new book, Nation States, is the latest. <coughs> he remains uh, a supporter of the Radical Independence Campaign and is a member of International Socialist Scotland, and rise Scotland's left lines. So I'd like you to welcome Neil Davidson. Okay. About two years ago, or 20 months ago, some of you were in this university were here to launch the last book that won, uh, Holding Fast to an Image of the Past. Um, unfortunately, uh, the book came out two weeks after the referendum result was announced. So instead of a talk about the book, you were subjected to a tirade for <laughs> four minutes about what had just happened uh, in, in the campaign. Um, it wouldn't have escaped your notice that there's another uh, referendum on at the moment, but I don't intend to talk about uh, the EU uh, referendum. Well, as I mentioned the EU and refer to it in, in passing, I'm not going to make the main thrust of the talk about that. I will actually talk about the book. Um, it's a collection of essays and some new material were written really over 15 years, from 1999 to 2014, um, bracketed by two essays which are really a product of political campaigns or movements I was involved in. And in fact, the last essay in the book, um, published in your left review a couple of years ago, is about the referendum campaign, and it, I think it's appropriate that it concludes with that, because there's no point in talking theoretically <laughs> about the nation and the state and so on, it has to in some way inform what we actually do. Uh, as political actors and, and people involved in the world. So I think it's right that you end with, I think it's actually about the campaign and how that operated. So was the first essay, uh, the essay on ethnicity, which really came out of um, a campaign that a couple of us set up in Edinburgh, a highly pompously titled Edinburgh Campaign Against War in Europe, <laughs> which was actually launched uh, at the time NATO was bombing former Yugoslavia uh, during the Kosovo crisis in 1999. Um, and I'd I was puzzled and worried by the way people talked about ethnicity during that conflict and the earlier conflict in the Balkans. And ethnic Muslims was a term that got thrown around an awful lot. I thought, what the earth was an ethnic Muslim? Islam is a religion. You know, why, why are you using this word to talk about these things? And I had kind of a sense of part of the argument about identity politics and the way that was conjured up um, made me deeply suspicious of the whole concept of ethnicity. And in fact, I think that we should enclose it in scare quotes in the same way as we do with the word race. Um, indicating that it's a highly dubious concept. Um, I did want to say something about that campaign. It lasted for three months, so it seemed much, much longer at the time. Uh, and that's particularly to do with one of the people who was involved in it with me, who I write about in the preface. Um, that's Alan Ray, a comrade who um, is now very ill with motor neuron disease. Um, and obviously can't be with us because of that. Well, we are filming this so we can show him what's, what's going on. And you can hear me talking about him. <laughs> um, um, uh, in 99, I think I'm meeting about four people in the Café Royal to set up this campaign against war in Europe and uh, discovered that he not only worked at the UCS uh, shipyard, although he actually arrived there six months after the set had finished, so he didn't actually take part of it, but had been part of the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign. <laughs> but how old can this guy possibly be? <laughs> in fact, he's only six, seven years older than me. But uh, so the, the 
friendship and comradeship that I've, I've enjoyed with Alan ever since then has been very important to me. And although he has a, I think, safe to say a volatile relationship with the organised revolutionary left, having left and rejoined the SWP at least five times, I think, back in the course of that period, um, Alan was never someone to, to, to contemplate the political world, is now, and so actually thinks it's something that we have to get involved in, even at his great age. Uh, when, I, when I met him and subsequently. So I think it, obviously I'd like everyone to share with me, passing on our best wishes to Alan, and that we're thinking about them for having this meeting in which they can't be at. So the rest of the book, between these kind of framing things, um, structured around about actual political um, campaigns and events, are looking at the problem of the nation state uh, and two aspects of it, which are summed up in the subtitle of consciousness and competition. Now, I think it's important to say that the, the book was written against a background of almost permanent war. I mean, that's one of the things that's fed into it. Um, the Kosovo War, a minor sort of dry run, but we then followed in Afghanistan and Iraq, all its horrors, and then <coughs> the failure of the, the revolutions in North Africa and the Middle East in 2011, uh, the, the, the bombing of Libya and so on. So it's been almost constant for the last 16 years. Uh, war awaits by, not exclusively, Russia has been involved in this as well, but by the Western powers, and often in the Middle East, and the devastating effects that we see. So that's part of the backdrop, and it also explains why two of the essays in here are about the Enlightenment, which may seem an odd <coughs> subject for a book about the nation state, but actually, if you recall, the arguments were made back in 2006 by people like Nick Cohen, and now, uh, thankfully, deceased Christopher Hitchens, about why we had to bomb the Middle East because of our Enlightenment values, which they didn't share, and how Islam was kind of uh, something that hadn't experienced in Enlightenment. I thought it was extremely important to, to include essays that actually challenged their understanding of what the Enlightenment was, and also to point out that Islam has a relationship with the Enlightenment as well, which is by no means um, this kind of nuggetary thing that was presented um, by, by, by the, the B-52 liberals, uh, as, as we call them. So that's why they are there, a part of the kind of general setup. But beyond that, the question of the nation states conducting war was also the question of, of Scotland itself, and although only a couple of the essays actually relate directly to Scotland, uh, my thinking about the, the national question, as we call it, about nations and what they are, was inspired by the Scottish situation. In fact, most of my thinking about most things, except neoliberalism, perhaps, has been inspired by thinking about Scottish conditions. The Scottish Revolution, um, the transition in Scotland, the question of the, the nation, the difference between national consciousness and nationalism are all themes that come up here. Now, let me try and state what I think the, the main thing I'm trying to get at in the book is. And it just takes us on a slight detour into thinking about the academic disciplines. For those of you who aren't academics, this may seem really weird kind of subject, but actually, if you think about well, when Adam Smith was alive, at least was writing, and um, was based in Glasgow University, um, where I teach at the moment, um, there wasn't any such thing as economics, or sociology, or <coughs> economic history, or um, what else, psychology. You know, these, these disciplines did not exist. There was political economy, and that encompassed all of these things. The Wealth of Nations isn't an economics textbook. It's a work of political economy which deals with all of the subjects I've just mentioned, plus history and a lot of other things as well, geography and a lot of other things in it as well. So that the sundering of the wholeness of the of political economy into a series of discrete disciplines is not a kind of neutral thing. It's not just a kind of form of specialization, as Weber uh, later said it was. It's something to do with a kind of ideological way of disconnecting economics from everything else. If you assume there's a thing called economics that doesn't involve social classes, it doesn't involve culture or politics and so on, then it's easy to talk about it as a kind of pseudoscience, which is pretty much the way it's taught now in this university and indeed in, the, in Glasgow, as a series of simultaneous equations and graphs without any reference to the actual world whatsoever. This is an appalled Smith as much as it would have appalled Marx, um, his one's greatest follower, and certainly someone cl far closer to Smith than, for example, Hayek or the neoclassical economic thinkers. So the problem of the fragmentation of the disciplines means it's very difficult to look at a particular subject um, in, in a way that doesn't, doesn't reproduce that fragmentation. So this, this is the problem with the nation state. Those nations, which is a form of identity, um, primarily how people think of themselves as being Scots or Euritarians, or whatever it is, um, and that's dealt with by social psychology or sociology. And then you've got the state, and that's dealt with by politics or international relations and so on. And never the twain shall meet. People don't tend to talk about them together. My point is you can't separate these two things out. You've got to maintain the, the nation hyphen state and see that the international moment of state competition on the one hand, how people think about themselves as their identity on the other, and hold them both in your mind at the same time. I have no doubt I failed miserably to do this in almost all of the essays in this book. I'll, I am going to draw 
on chapter 7, which is the one where I explore in most detail and try and actually look at the two things together. Um, but I say I'll slip in and out of different modes of what I'm going to say. So, first of all, put this, and also I should just make the point, although this is controversial for some people, that when I say nation states, I mean capitalist nation states. There are no nation states before capitalism. There was not, for example, a nation state in Scotland in, oh, let's say, 1320 or 1314, and there couldn't have been, you know, because the, for the people could not simply have the consciousness of themselves as, as, as belonging to a nation at that point. They belonged to a kingdom, and they had a king, you know, so obviously, and they maybe travel with a well, lucky five miles beyond the village in their entire lives. You know, how can you possibly have some sense of, we now think of as nationhood under these conditions? So, nation states are modern. You know, I'm a modernist in this, as in several other things. Um, and that means that it comes into existence with capitalism, first of all in England, uh, in the 16th century, and then it spreads around the rest of the world. Okay, what does a nation state do? And this is emphasizing the state. Essentially, there's three functions. And I've used the word function advisedly, as I'm sure Jamie will point out later on. One is to provide the kind of general conditions for capitalism to operate, like roads, electricity, or, or other forms of transport, a legal system. The kind of things that capitalists won't do for themselves as individual capitalists or get together to do. Something that has to be organized by a higher body, the state, the police force, and so on. The second thing is it has to maintain a kind of order um, horizontally. Uh, amongst the capitalists themselves, so because they're in competition with each other, right? So you can't let competition get out of control. So there has to be something of order established between them horizontally, but also an order vertically between the capitalists up there and the workers down there, ensuring that it always works out in the interests of, of the capitalist. And finally, the third thing is that it's got to represent the interests of all of the, cap the national capital. It's called all of the capitalists who operate within an individual state, whether they're native or foreign, based there or whatever. It has to represent all of those externally to the rest of the world, to other states. In other words, geopolitics, international relations, it has to play this, this kind of role. Uh, if it can't do that, if it can't protect its own capital, it's not much use. So this is general, that's been the case since the system began to emerge in the 16th century. We're encountering, I think, new problems now, which um, perhaps weren't uh, visible 100 years ago when most of the classic Marxist discussions of, of the nation were, were held. The problem of failed states, for example, like the Democratic Republic of the Congo or Libya, essentially where the state is simply disintegrated under the effects of war and internal uh, collapse. We're seeing the emergence or re-emergence of stateless nations, of which Scotland is obviously one, but Catalonia, Quebec, perhaps Wallonia, in the advanced capitalist West, uh, where there are former nations are emerging or beginning to assert themselves in that kind of way, um, either for, for, for greater autonomy or for absolute outright uh, statehood and independence. And we're also seeing the emergence of what I suppose called supra nation state bodies, of which the European Union, of course, is one, which appear to overarch uh, the functions of individual nation states. Now, mentioning that brings me on to the, I suppose, the beginning of the, the proper discussion, and that is why, why are there individual nation states? Why isn't there just one big state, you know, that, that governs everything? And, and of course, some people think in the European sense that's what the EU is trying to do. They're sadly mistaken. The EU simply simply, complicatedly, reproduces all of the unevenness and rivalry and, and uh, issues of power within the EU that are outside it. So Germany right, is obviously the top dog in the EU. It used to be Germany and France, now it's increasingly just Germany um, that basically issues the orders and sets the tone uh, for, the, for how the central bank operates and so on. So it isn't in any sense really superseding that, whatever the fantasies of Boris and uh, Michael Gove and so on. But let's have a couple of thought experiments here about other ways the world could be organised other than the way it's organised at the moment. So, just imagine, it's a dreamy kind of music here, and we're thinking of what this would look like. Suppose there's a, a situation where you've got one gigantic state covering the entire world, and it controls the whole economy. Right? There are no individual capitalists or individual firms, and I think everything's just controlled by the state totally. Now, this kind of thing's been imagined in kind of science fiction nightmare scenarios, I suppose, since H.G. Wells, The Sleeper Awakes, back in 1905, and maybe even earlier than that. Um, and this kind of society would be clearly not capitalist because there's only one, there's only one economy, if you like, and you have to have competition for that to be capital, right? Uh, it would be either, if it was democratic, then it would be socialism, um, but if it wasn't democratic and involved different classes and exploitation and so on, then it would be a new form of class society. The kind of thing imagined, I suppose, by Orwell in 1984, although there's three of them, and that, with that idea that the total 
uh, nightmare in Minnesota society that people thought might emerge if Russia, Stalinist Russia had conquered the world during the Cold War and so on. Now, people, uh, Marxists, Bakaran, Marx himself, Lenin, uh, contemplated the idea that this might come into existence but rejected it and said that to get to that point of establishing a single state would require such a terrible level of war and violence that actually it would destroy the entire state. You'd never get to it because the world would be obliterated in, in warfare before you even got to that point, or it would be overthrown by revolution. So nobody really considers this a feasible option, and neither do I. A second thought experiment, then, is where you've got no state at all, but lots of individual capitalist firms and companies and so on. This is a kind of anarcho-capitalist dream, which is most associated, I suppose, with the, frankly, the barking positions of Ayn Rand, um, the American novelist author of the with Atlas Shrugs and the Fountainhead and things like this. Um, and the idea is, no, there's no state, you don't need a state whatsoever. It's up to powerful people and, and strong uh, capitalists to, to fight for what they want and, and, and all this. One of Rand's followers was Alan Greenspan, who worryingly was actually the head of the, the, the Federal Reserve in, in America for, for nearly a decade. But he actually wrote in his autobiography and said, well, there's a problem with this iron. <laughs> and that is that actually you need, you know, like a post office, you need a kind of police, you need an army, you need a rail. The thing I mentioned earlier on, I mean, the infrastructural stuff, so you can't have, it's not, it's not possible to have this kind of, this fantastic thing. Again, you wouldn't be able to operate a system without, with this kind of way. So finally, what the third thing would be, okay, a single state, again, as, a, as in the first one, but many capitals, many different competing firms and so on. Why isn't that possible? Should that be the best solution for capitalism? Because it would, it would take away the tendency for wars to happen, for one thing. You would just have one state without then they wouldn't be fighting with each other and so on. Now, most people think this isn't very likely to happen. I mean, there, is, there are one or two people, William Robinson and a handful of people, who think it's, it's taking place. And I suppose part of the negative thing about empire, um, fashionable about so that years ago was, was a kind of anticipation of this kind of view. But most people think it's not possible for this to happen. What's interesting is why you think it's not possible, why you always need different states. Um, it's not because it would be too uneven. I mean, there's an idea that um, people have said, well, we would have really backward areas, you have really advanced areas, they couldn't exist without a single state. But actually, that's not true, because even now, you have very advanced and very backward areas than individual states. I mean, well, actually, Scotland, you know, uh, the lowlands of Scotland are the most advanced industrial area in the world during the uh, 1830s and 40s, and the highlands are one of the most backward. You know, so, and Italy, similarly with the north and south of Italy, and, and, and or even Brazil now, actually, think about Sao Paulo, and compared a lot to the northeast of, of Brazil. So that's not, that's not a reason. The real uh, argument, I think, comes out of three different positions. One is that the reason why we have multiple nation states is simply a contingent outcome of history. Uh, is because capitalism emerged in the 16th, 17th centuries at a time when the world was divided up in the old feudal absolutist state system in Europe, and it just inherited that. If capitalism had come into existence in the 5th century AD, at the time of the Roman Empire, then we'd have empires, there wouldn't have been nation states and so on. Not that's very plausible, capitalism couldn't possibly have come into existence in the 5th century AD, but well, just, just hypothetically as, as, a, as, a, as a position. Um, I don't actually think this is, this is a, a, a very plausible argument. It's one that tends to be made by political Marxists like Robert Brenner and his followers, especially his followers. Um, for one thing, it isn't true that, that capitalism simply inherited the existing state system. It destroyed it. That's what the bourgeois revolution was about. You know, it was actually taking, it was destroying the states and erecting new ones. They may have been called the same things, they may even have been in the same territories, but actually they totally destroyed the, the, the internal structures of, of feudalism. Um, even if, in, as in this country, some of the appurtenances like you know, the monarchy and the House of Lords were still maintained. You know, this was the most bourgeois country in the world, and the, the idea that it's still feudal hangovers and stuff is simply nonsense. And secondly, capitalism is added to all these states. I mean, at the time of the French Revolution, there were only about 40 states in the world, and some tribal um, peoples and so on didn't really have states. And um, there's now 199. <laughs> you know, so it's massively increased the number of states, and fragmentation is actually the, the rule now. Not, not coming together. I mean, the, the, I suppose China taking over Hong Kong or, or Saddam's failed attempt to take over Kuwait, you know, with, with attempts on one successful or not to actually merge. It actually is fragmentation, disintegration, and increasing number of states of things happening. So a second argument is about that there's really two logics here. There's a kind of logic of the state and there's a logic of capitalism, and they kind of interweave because they're convenient for each other. And this is an argument put by Giovanni Ricci, by Alex Kalinikas, by David Harvey, and several other Marxist thinkers. Um, the only problem I have with this, the only problem I have with this, is it's not actually a very Marxist position, because it basically says that the state is somehow separate from capitalism, 
and just as a kind of separate existence, and the two things just happened to co come together because of a, con a contingent set of interests. Um, I mean, that's fine if you're a follower of Max Weber or, or people who think that every, every aspect of human life is kind of separated from every other, but I can't think that's a position that, that certain either Marxists can take. So the final position, um, and this is my one, is uh, one really derives from the Hungarian Marxist thinker George Lukács' uh, idea of mediated totality, which is actually that society is a kind of total whole and it can't be separated off into that bits about the state, that bits about culture, that bits about the economy, and that in fact, starting from capital's the relationships, which are typical of capitalism, competition between capitalists on the one hand, exploitation of workers by capitalists on the other, you actually require a, state, a certain kind of state form. Now, two aspects, as I said, in the title, the aspect of competition, um, between states and the idea of consciousness, of the nation uh, as a kind of consciousness. So let's talk about competition, first of all. Uh, capitalists claim to like competition. That's one of the big things we're all about. It's efficient. And all that. Actually, they hate competition. The main driver has always been to establish monopolies. Ever since Merchants began to emerge in the 16th century, uh, Ferdinand Bradell, the great French historian, details this very well in his massive books about the world in the 15th century. Of course, they don't want competition. And they certainly, not only that, they want the state to protect them. You know, the wild uh, entrepreneurs and so on, of course, are all running, begging to the state. Was it, was it Mauro who said something like, um, it takes a financial crisis, there's nothing like a financial crisis for reminding entrepreneurs what state they actually belong to, or what nation they actually belong to, in man's state. Of course, I've seen that recently, obviously, in 2008, um, 2009, when they've all been begging the state to bail them out after the, the, the crisis. So, you know, they, they want the state to do something. But if there was a single state, if there was just one state, then actually, who is the, the, the that state going to privilege? Who's it going to help? And so, you, 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 if, if, if you've just got one state, it's like having no state, almost, because it can't help one group as opposed to another. Not without those, that group then saying, well, wait a minute, we want our own state to kind of, you know, to, to protect us and to shield us and so on. So the kind of logic of, of disintegration, the logic of multiplicity, is almost built into this, you know, from, uh, and the type of